I have to be a student. I have to be studying all the time. And you know, I never leave studying. In fact, if I wanted to, I couldn't because it's just part of me. I'm reading a book now, and it's called um, AD 2000, Countdown on AD 2000. And what it means is this. We're looking at how to evangelize the world by 2000 AD. And in that book, I have more than 168 strategies on how to evangelize the world. And just 10 of those strategies will make you to be able to evangelize not just Nigeria alone, not just Africa alone. I'm talking about evangelizing the whole world. I'm studying all the time. Not only that, I study about Africa. I study, I study a lot of things. You know, some time ago, I went to the United States. I went to Britain. And uh, this uh, Christian Union uh, in the college, uh, they heard about my being in Britain. I was in this particular school. And as I was in that school, sorry, in that church, uh, preaching to the people. So the Christian Union heard that, uh, you know, I came from Nigeria. So they said they would like me to come and talk to them. So I said, that's all right. And uh, during the afternoon, one of the ministers there, the assistant pastor, he took me to the Christian Union. And then we finished uh, the meeting. I preached to them from the Bible. But then, while I was preaching, the sociology class at the university, they heard that uh, a Nigerian is around, and you know, he studied mathematics, and was a lecturer before. And so they said, well, when he finishes, please call him. We want to know whether he can speak to our sociology students. Not Bible now and not, uh, you know, scripture, not gospel, not evangelism, just talk to us about sociology. And uh, so when I finished and, you know, I preached the message to the Christian Union and prayed for them and counseled, then the assistant pastor said, I don't know whether you will, you know, like this or whether you are ready for this. The sociology class is waiting and the lecturer said that, um, he will not want to lecture today. He wants to expose the English uh, students, that's the uh, British uh, students, to sociology uh, the way it is in Africa. Do you think you'll be ready to, you know, speak to them? Oh, I said, give me five minutes, you know, to prepare my outline, you know, because I always like all these alliterations. You know, if I start with a P, I go with a P. And um, so I said, uh, give me five minutes. And they gave me five minutes, and then I got there, and I said, how much time do you have? You know, because I could take them on for more than one hour. And so they said, well, we have, uh, you know, about one hour, but we don't want you to spend all the one hour. We'd like you to spend about 30 minutes in lecturing us and 30 minutes question and answer time. And uh, then they said, do you, did they tell you it's not Bible we want? I said, yes. <laughs> I said I knew, I knew about that. And uh, so I started with them and I began to lecture them on Africa, you know, just sociology, about the politics, about the places, about the people, about a lot of things in Africa. I couldn't uh, cut myself to 30 minutes, I spent 45 minutes. Then I said, now you can ask your questions. And if you know British uh, university students, they ask questions. And they thought they will, you know, they will ask questions that will, you know, just make you to say, well, I'm sorry, I didn't prepare, I, didn't, I don't know about that. But we took another 45 minutes answering those questions on sociology. And I didn't quote the Bible. I quoted, you know, authorities and, you know, in Africa, this and this. I gave them statistics, I, you know, just off the top of my head. When we finished, uh, the assistant pastor that went with me said, now you must tell me something. <laughs> that uh, you, you have never lectured in sociology. You told me you lectured in mathematics before. I said yes, but uh, I don't restrict myself to just one area. You, you know, if you are going to reach out, you have to be broad, broad, broad-minded. And then he said, but apart from that, I'm even surprised too that Apart from the fact that you never lectured that before, you have been, because I stayed, I was living with that pastor. Uh, you know, I will go from their house to their church. And they said, I'm surprised the way you spend your life. I don't come out in the morning to take breakfast, breakfast in time. I study. I give myself to studying. And that, uh, you know, you are called here. I thought that these people will embarrass you with questions. And he said, 
you know, he is white. He couldn't do that. Even with those students who are white like himself. And you are a black man coming from Africa. And you, you know, can do this at ease. I said yes because we have a calling to be students. And that's what I'm passing on to you. We must be students. You see, I went to Zambia. And uh, as I got to, we went to preach the gospel. And, you know, we had a retreat. As we were coming back, we had to come back through Zimbabwe. And we stayed in the house of a family. You know, this, uh, you know, highly placed uh, family. And they had uh, one of their daughters who is, uh, in, uh, you know, at school. And uh, the girl was laboring with, uh, you know, some mathematical uh, jargons. You know, she had difficulty. And we are there overnight, uh, myself and my wife, were there uh, with the family, so that the next day we'll be able to take a plane from Zimbabwe and come to Nigeria. And because I was free that uh, time, uh, I saw that, you know, the girl went to the mother and said, Mommy, this thing is too hard, I can never understand, mathematics is not my, you know, it's not my way. And I overheard what he was saying, and I said, what's the matter, can I be of help to you? And uh, so uh, she said, uh, well, this, um, we're talking about mathematics, I yes. <laughs> I said, yes, I know. Um, you know, and she, she sat down, and I said, what don't you understand? She said, she doesn't understand this. I said, well, we must do some remedial teaching before I get to that. You see, sometimes you have to go to A before you get to B. Get B before you get to C. I saw that her problem is she didn't understand a principle or a theory before that thing. So I went on that. Now, that doesn't have to take me 30 minutes, you know, if you've been teaching for a long time. And after I got her through that, then I came to the problem, and uh, she, she paid attention, and she understood everything, and we arrived at the answer. You know, as a young, uh, a young girl, she went to the back of the book to compare the, <laughs> to compare the answer with the answer with God, and I left her alone to check up. And she said, oh, oh, it's correct. Uh, but, you know, you ought to be students of the Word of God. But not only being students of the Word of God, if you are going to reach out to schools, you ought to know enough that you'll be able to say, you are not just a fellow that is, you are preaching what you don't understand. You go deep into the Word of God. You know the lives of the people. And you can teach authoritatively. So, in fact, in the world in which we live now, people are getting to realize the importance of fishing for students, fishing for young people, fishing for uh, the people that are still below the age of 25. Do you know that in the world in which we live today, 50% of the population of the world is under 25 years of age. That means we have two and a half billion people I didn't say million, billion people. Do you know what a billion is? When you write a figure and you put three zeros after that figure, you are talking in thousands. When you write a figure and you put six zeros after that figure, you are talking in millions. When you write a figure and you put nine zeros after that figure, you are talking in billions now. And there are 5 billion people, actually about 5 and a half billion in the world, more than 5 billion. And half of the billions of people make up children or young people below the age of 25, 25 years of age. A lot of people are teenagers. In Africa here we have 45% of Africa as less than 15 years of age, from 15 and under. Therefore, that means that a lot of work needs to be done by reaching out. And brothers and sisters, do you know, there is a serious neglect of evangelism towards young people. Look at all the churches. All the churches concentrate on reaching out to adults. Even the children, even though they say they have, a, you know, children church or they have whatever, some school for children, they're not doing much. They just keep the children away from the adult churches so that nobody will disturb. And when churches are trying to see how they will spend their money, they spend their money on the adults, on the adult church. They don't do so much for the children, for the young, young people. And we need to understand that we have a special ministry 
fishing for the young people. And you have that ministry. You have that calling. The question is, will you allow God to continue working with you? And you continue working with God so that you can fulfill your calling. Now, as, even, as you even look at deeper life, it will surprise you that some of the states do not have a vibrant, ongoing, dynamic outreach to the students. As I looked at the attendance of the people today, that is, or yesterday rather, uh, as I looked at the attendance of, at this Congress, now we have more than 400 from Lagos. Then we have a few from all the other states. Do you know there are some states we have less than five? that have come now and there are thousands of students or millions of students in those states now what will only one representative do from a particular state what will two three five representatives do from a particular state we need to understand that the student work is a great calling it's a high calling you know what I've discovered also I've discovered that even for those some of you who are here that are supposed to be working with um, the students in the secondary school, or maybe you are now at the university, and you came because of the campus fellowship, and because the campus fellowship could not have their congress, you said, well, let me just join in with these people, and you ought to be working on the campuses, reaching out to those students. You know, there are some of us there who are torn in between two opinions. I know that, you know, our church especially in the state, will rather have me to be working in the house fellowship and doing this. It's when I do that, they will regard me as a worker. All these other things we're doing with students, our state overseers don't care for them. Because of that, you are unfaithful to your calling. You are discouraged. You cannot really do the work. And this is where we need the greatest number of people to work. You see, adults are very easy to lead. I see thousands of people, you know, at the Bagada Church and also here. Sometimes, myself alone, I could handle all the people together. But get all the children together, it's difficult for one person to handle them. We need more workers. And if you are here as a worker, working with the students and working with the young people, we need you. And you must know that you have a calling and fulfill that calling. Will you? Will you really do it? and motivate and encourage other people that we need them. When you get to your states, now the states where, uh, you know, you have not been fully represented, you know, I don't want to call out the names of, of those states. You know why? When you, are, when you are rebuking the people that are not there, because you who have come, you have done well. Even if you are only one from your state, only two or three from your state, you have done well. If I mention your state now, all the other people and, you know, in the Congress here, they'll be looking at you kind of funny, saying, ah, so you are the state they mentioned. You are the fellow that didn't have uh, many, many people. We'll be punishing the present people for those who are absent. And we don't want to punish those who are present for those who are absent. You know what I mean? Those who are absent, they are the people we ought to rebuke, and they are not here. Even if I rebuke them here now, it's the people who have done well that will bear the load and the blame of their absence. So those people who are here, you're only one or two, I congratulate you. You're good, good people. But the people that are not here, don't tell them. <laughs> but they are not very good. Don't tell them that's what I said. You see, as I've watched all over the years, when I was, when I became a Christian, the Lord gave me a vision as well as a burden. And the burden was so serious and the burden was so great that I couldn't shake it up. I knew the Lord wanted me to preach the gospel. I didn't know that I could because I didn't have the boldness, the courage, the ability. It didn't appear that the Lord had chosen a right vessel because I wasn't like, you know, many other people. I knew he wanted me to reach out. And I can remember now as I think back to the 60s and the early 70s, a lot of people that ran ahead and they wanted to preach the gospel. They were bold. They were fiery. It appeared that they could really do a great work. 
But to see what I discovered, eventually I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't think that I can do too much, but since you put this burden in my heart, or this vision in my heart, this revelation you are giving me, I said, Lord, I will. And slowly, 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 I got involved, and we started doing it. There is one thing that has been, uh, you know, an advantage for me. The advantage is this. I never get distracted. Well, somebody's eyes was opened, and he was allowed to see the devil. And, um, you know, he was in his own house, and the devil came. You see, the, de the Bible says, sometimes Satan is turned to an angel of light. And as this uh, brother, this brother I'm talking about, is passed on to glory now. He's not a Nigerian. He's a British. He died uh, last year, and he had a great, great ministry. And as he had this vision, he saw this figure so beautiful. And looking at the color, the skin, everything, so beautiful. And the Spirit of God said, you are not looking at an angel, you are looking at Satan. And so, this uh, minister of the gospel, he was used of God in, you know, the miracle ministry a lot before he died. And then he said, Satan, I recognize you. And he rebuked him, and he turned to the most ugliest creature he had ever seen. That's what I'm telling you. You see, when you see these things in the world, if you look at the world without the eyes of the Spirit, the world will look attractive, will look beautiful. You will think, I am missing a lot if I don't get this thing of the world when you look at the eyes of the Spirit of God. And you can say, Satan, I recognize you, you will see the most ugliest thing you have ever seen. The world is ugly. There is nothing beautiful in the world. There is nothing attractive in the world. It is only when you are fooled or when you are deceived that you will think there is something attractive in the world. You see, there are a lot of people. They are not rugged. They are not committed to real hardship. And I thank the Lord. You see, 1979... We had an opening in Ghana, actually from 1978. But 1979, we really started going to Ghana, and I will go at the weekend, and we'll go by road, and it was quite hard, quite hard. Sometimes at the borders uh, from Togo to Ghana, they will stop us, and they had no place to put us, we'll just stay in the sun there. And when you are hungry, all that you could eat will be that you will have some, you know, bread or whatever, milk. But those things, sometimes they are so hot that you really don't enjoy them. And eventually we get to Ghana. And the place will get accommodation. The beds will be full of these, uh, you know, bed birds, insects. That when you wake up in the morning, you will see that the whole bed had been stained by your blood. And yet... We needed to do some work there, real foundational work. And you know, sometimes I was there. That time I was a lecturer at the University of Lagos. And when you think about it as a lecturer, I exposed myself to all that type of danger and, you know, bad, bad condition there. And uh, we were there in Ghana, and they closed their borders because they wanted to change their money because uh, of the black market. And when they closed their borders, and I didn't even take permission from the University of Lagos because I, was, I just went on a Friday so as to do something there and come back Sunday night. That Friday, they made the announcement over the radio all over Ghana that they were closing the borders. And uh, some of us went to Accra and we pleaded with the officials that, uh, well, we are not Ghanaians, we don't have your money. They said, well, sorry, if we open the... Uh, border for you. Some of the Ghanaians who are outside, they will try to sneak in. And they wanted to do that thorough exchange of their cities. That's of their currency. So we were not allowed. And I was in there. No money. No food. No good accommodation. And the place we got, the place was so bad. Even in my early childhood days, when I was in primary school, I don't remember sleeping in conditions like that. 
And of course, when you're a university student, and those days, university was, you know, rated high in the, you know, early 60s. I went to university in 1964 at University of Ibadan, you know, a very good, great university. And, uh, you know, to have been in such a place and be in that place in Ghana, it was hard. Very, very hard. No good food. And, you know, there was no tracks for us to use because I didn't go with a lot of tracks. What am I to do now? You know, immediately, I sat down. And since I wrote the tracts in Nigeria here, I could sit down and write new tracts. And the people were lining up in Ghana, in all the banks, because they needed to exchange the old currency for the new currency. Immediately, I wrote tracts on salvation, on evangelism. And the following day, I took them to the press over there. I didn't have money. I said, take my word. I'll pay you later. There's no money now. You know the borders are closed. And they printed everything for me. And I got some people in Ghana. And I distributed them to all the banks where people were waiting. And I said, go and distribute there. When we did that in Kumasi, I sent people to all the towns in Ghana. And I said, this is how to do the work of God. Hard days, but fruitful days. But you know now, Ghana has established a deeper life. In Accra alone, our church is more than 2,000 in membership. In Kumasi, our church is more than 1,500. They had a retreat this year, April. You know how many people in the retreat? More than 17,000 at the retreat. But you see, you must be able to endure hardship. That's what you do. If you're able to endure hardship at the beginning, and you say, well, I don't care for the hardship, love, of money. Love of money. And uh, I thank God for the way God has led me. As I look through my life now, at that time, nobody understood me. I'm talking about many, many years ago. When I came out of university in 1967, I had this burden in my heart that I should reach out to people. That the only thing I should do is to just reach out to people and preach the gospel. But it so happened that when I came out of university, uh, there were three of us in 1967 that made first class, two of us in mathematics and one in chemistry. My partner, who made first class in mathematics, I, you know, got more marks than himself, but both of us still fell into uh, the first class category. He is now professor at the University of Lagos. And um, when I was lecturing at the University of Lagos, he got there before me. Uh, when I got there, we were in a staff meeting, and, uh, you know, I was being introduced, and he was there, and they didn't know that he knew me, and they were introducing me to him and saying, uh, you know, prof, this is uh, so-and-so. Oh, he said, I know him. Oh, he came out of university together. He, in fact, used to teach me. I used to teach him complex variables. Uh, so, but now he was, uh, you know, professor and all that. But, you see, when I came out of university, the university, without making any application, they gave me scholarship. And they said, I shall come for PhD immediately. I turned it down. I said, no. There's a burden in my heart. There's a vision within me that I need to carry out. And that PhD at that time will hinder me. You know, everybody was surprised. I showed Annie, our principal. He called me and he said, the school may fly. Will release me. I should go. I said, not necessary. I have one of my uncles who was, you know, Minister of Education in our state. And, uh, you know, all our, my relatives, some of them top-level people in, you know, things of the world, in education and in politics. But then, you know, they called me and they said, days and days, I said, I'm sorry. Uh, even though I'm part of the family, I have my life to live. And I'm an individual. I have something I wanted to do. And think about it, at that time there was no deeper life, but there was the burden and the vision and the revelation, and I knew that something was waiting for me. And you see, when I came to the University of Lagos, Professor C.O. Taiwo, who was uh, leading the provost of the College of Education then, he made arrangements with Chelsea College in London, and he sent me there for about uh, three months to go and do something. They made a private arrangement. They knew they couldn't convince me in Nigeria that I should go for three years. And that time we had started Deeper Life, 1974. When I got there in 1974, the provost over there called me to his office and he said, 
Um, Mr. Kumoy, we have enjoyed your stay at Chelsea College here for just a brief period, three months, uh, just more than two months, and you are going back. But uh, Professor C.O. Taiwo told me to talk to you and try to convince you if you can stay over here for three years. And you know what they will do? That time I was away, they were paying my salary here, and they were paying me salary in London, 1974. And if I stayed there for three years, you know what they will do? They will continue paying my salary every month in Lagos here, and paying me, and the salary here was complete. It was not part of the one I was receiving in London. The one in London will be complete. I looked at the professor and I said, Sir, I'm sorry. I have something else that I'm doing. It's not only lecturing that I'm doing, that I have to go back to Nigeria. Oh, he said, do you know what you are missing? Do you know what we are offering you? Do you know this and that? Because I will not stay with the student body. I will have separate accommodation in London. I will be free. I will do whatever I wanted to do. And the area I wanted, I should have done the research was, you know, a special area that they didn't have at the University of Lagos. I said, I know what you are saying, but I cannot do it. I will have to turn down the three years of, you know, easy life in that place. You know, when I was there, I was attending lectures only Tuesdays and Thursdays, I think, only two days in the week. And the rest of the time, I studied on my own, you know, because I went as a lecturer. I, wasn't, I didn't go as just a student. Now, I turned that down because of what I had to do. And I came back to Nigeria. When Professor Sio Taiwo saw me, he said, you are back? I said, yes. He said, uh, did Professor such and such speak to you about this offer? I said, he did. He said, uh, what are you thinking about it? I said, you know, sir, I'm sorry about this, that I cannot take it all. He said, is it because of this Bible study? Because, you know, we're having Bible study at that time at the University of Lagos. Is it because of this Bible study? I smiled and said, yes, sir. He shaked his head and he said, what a pity. And you know, uh, another time, Tashiolani wrote an article in the newspapers. He was, I was a little bit angry. And he wrote about all these people that are wasting their brain. And he wrote about Okoje, mentioned my name, mentioned another fellow, that these people that have great, great brains and talents, they are in religion. But all that doesn't bother me. I have a call. Do you have a call? Do you, are you ready to do something for the glory of God in the life in which we are living now? I believe you will do something. I said I believe you will, you will do something. Are you willing to pay the price? Or now, as you look at what God is doing now, do you think I have anything to regret about? Am I regretting that, you know, all these wonderful things, you know, in the world, that I kicked them off and now I am doing what I'm doing? You know, if you are like me and you've seen all these blind eyes opening, you've seen all these lame people walking, you'll see, men, you have seen mental people, you know, receiving sanity immediately. You know, 19, uh, 1980, and that time we had started Deeper Life, we had a crusade at um, Tapa Balewa Square in August 1980. But before then, I needed, because I was still lecturing, I needed to do some research program. And my supervisor was in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. And so I needed to go to him. And from the University of Lagos, I was given three months and also given another three months because they thought the thing will take me six months before I finished. And I went. And when I got to Alexandria, I told my supervisor, I said, Supervisor, I must go back in August. Ah, he said, look, you have come from Nigeria. Forget about that uh, religion. Because you're always in a hurry. He was in Nigeria before. He said, when I was in Nigeria, you never gave enough time. And therefore, we couldn't finish this, uh, we couldn't finish this research work. And now, if you don't pay attention and you are not patient and you are, you know, talking about uh, going back to Nigeria, you'll never finish this thing. I said, um, how long should it take? Oh, he said, it will take us the six months they have given you. And, and if it took those six months, I'll not be able to come back to Nigeria and have that crusade. And the university had paid for everything. You know, they paid the flights, they paid money, they paid a lot of things. You know, when you are sent out like that, it's, you know, it's just enjoying life. And um, 
So I told him that, well, supervisor, if you can just uh, go at my pace, don't go at your pace, that I'll finish within the time, and I'll still go back to Nigeria. He said, there's no way it's impossible. Because they are taking a lot of people in research work, and they are never able to finish like that. I said, well, just give me the problem, and then I will go and work on it. Then he'll give me the problem, and I say, when do I come back? He'll say, come back in two weeks' time. Because in research work, you will not be able to, you cannot read it in the library, you cannot read it anywhere, you have to, you know, work it out yourself. It has never been done. That's what we call research. And uh, so I said, but will you be around tomorrow? Who will he will say, I'll be around, but, but uh, you cannot finish. It will take another two weeks. The second day I've done it, and I go back to him. And he will look at it and say, how did you get it? I said, because I need to go back in time. <laughs> and then, well, before about, I think, five or six weeks, I had finished. And he wrote a recommendation to the University of Lagos, and he said he has never seen something like this in all these years of supervising research work. And he told them, this man, university needs him, grab him very well. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's difficult for them to see anything like that. And yet, do you know, at the time I was doing that, I read my New Testament I don't know how many times, even in, in Alexandria. Uh, he thought I was spending all my time doing research, but not me. I spent all my, I was already preparing my message for the crusade I was going to have here. And that's where I got some of the messages that I preached at that time, take ye away the stone. It was while I was over there, you know, I could do all that and still do all this. I could manage everything together. But eventually I decided I wanted to resign. The first time I resigned at the University of Lagos, they threw back the uh, resignation paper to me. They said, no, you are not going anywhere. <laughs> they said, you can do all the preaching you want to do, preach on radio, preach on television, preach anywhere, keep the job. And I, the following year, I resigned again. And before I turned in the application to resign, I had to go and beg the head of the department and say, head of the department, please, uh, when they consider this thing, please support me and release me, that I want to go. There's a lot of work wait, waiting for me. He looked at me and talked to me. But because even though he was head of the department at that time, he was my junior at the University of uh, Ibadan. So because he was my junior, I could talk to him. And he said, okay, if that is what you want, that's eventually I got released. It was by force that I had to leave the University of Lagos. All those things could have distracted me. But do you know that now I don't have any regrets? There's nothing to regret about because I enjoy what I'm doing. And I, I give you a challenge like this. Why should I be the only person that will give my life to evangelizing this country? We need you. You can do it. Can't you do it? You can do it. You need to be wise. Wise because of the people you are trying to reach. That God will give you the wisdom to know how to reach them. Now when I talk about wisdom, you see, we need to understand if God wants you to do something, you need wisdom to do it. And um, when I preach to adults, that is, if I preach in the adult church, my approach is a little bit different. As I come to you and I see the people you are reaching, my approach is a little bit different. I was in Ogun State, and the state overseer at Abel Okota said that uh, the little, little children have heard that, uh, you know, a big daddy from Lagos has come, and they want to uh, have the opportunity of seeing you, and maybe you like to talk to them. I said, that's all right. They came. Little, little, little children. And uh, as they came, and I prayed and I said, Lord, I've been preaching to adults, all these young, young people. How can I make them to understand the salvation message? So as there were many of them, you know, talking, I mean, little tiny thoughts and primary school level and young, young, young people. So I asked them, how many of you go to school and they raised up their hands? How many of you know the latrine in your school? They raised up their, their hands. I said, how many of you know the headmaster? They raised up their hands. I said, do you think your headmaster would live in the latrine? Oh, they said, no. He never comes to that place. He never lives in the latrine. 
Where does he stay? He stays in his room. That's in his office. I said, your heart is like a latrine. And it is so dirty and so polluted and so corrupted. And our great headmaster, king of kings and the lord of lords, he will never live in the latrine. But you can do something. You can wash that latrine so clean and take all the dirty things out of that place. And when it is clean, he will turn it from latrine to an office. And Jesus can come and live there. And from there I started, I could talk to them about salvation. You need wisdom. If you are going to preach the gospel, if you are going to lead people to know the Lord, you need wisdom.